Acts chapter 21. The next unit in our study of the book of Acts is to be found in chapters 21 to 23. This story, uh, particularly from about verse 17 of chapter 21 through the 23rd chapter, covers a period of four days. And all of these chapters are related. This morning, what I want to do with you is to simply spend a little time reflecting on the story and uh, the lessons that it has for us. In particular, I would like to impress upon you one primary point, and that is that God prepares his people for the job that he brings to them or them to in their lives for him, in their service for him. If you're a Christian this morning, I am convinced that God has something that he wants you to do for him. He has a line of service. We were focusing on this in chapter 20 in our last time together about three weeks ago, I think, uh, in, in which we looked at Paul's philosophy of ministry and how that um, it was very clear to him. He had a very specific philosophy, principles, uh, which he based his actions upon and what he was goals to which he was striving, objectives which he sought to reach, me a methodology by which he operated. And he did it the same way, repeatedly. And that is one of the reasons why Paul was so successful in his ministry, because he, he knew where he was going, he knew how he was going to do it, and he did it in cooperation with the Spirit of God. He was submitted to the Lord's will for his life. And we as believers need to imitate the example of Paul as given to us in the Scriptures. That's why it's there. And we can go further this morning and see how from the development shortly thereafter where Paul left his friends up in Asia and went to Jerusalem that in what happened to him it was very obvious that Paul had come full circle. He started off in 35 A.D. in the city of Jerusalem, young, very emotional, very highly motivated Pharisee. He was a fanatic. What, what the Christians were for Christian, for as followers of Jesus, Paul or Saul then, at Saul of Tarsus at that time, was equally fanatical for Judaism, and uh, and you know the story. And now, 57 A.D., a number of years have passed, and he comes back to Jerusalem for the fourth time in these chapters. We're going to look at it this morning. And it is here that God, I believe, brought him back to Jerusalem after a whole series of specific events that I believe prepared him for this visit to Jerusalem. It was at this point that God did something for Paul that he had saved him to do. And so that's what we're looking at this morning. We're going to try to draw lessons from Paul's example to observe in his life how God specially prepares people for the job that he has in store for each of them. Just to illustrate this principle one, one bit farther, I believe that you can see in the scriptures that God has always had his agents ready to perform his will at very precise moments. There's nothing accidental about the plan and the program of God. We talk about accidents, like we had an accident this week. We ran into somebody we had no intention of. We didn't plan it. It wasn't in our goal for that day or something happened to us. We call it accidental. Please observe that in the plan and the program of God, there is absolutely nothing accidental. He is, our God is so big, He is so wise, He is so marvelous, infinite in wisdom and power and glory, that He knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything that's going to happen. He's laid it out. He has predicted to us the major happenings. He's told us what to expect and how to prepare for it. But He also knows the details. Jesus said that that the Father in heaven knows uh, the number of hairs on your head and he sees when the sparrow falls. Now God is so omnipotent and yet so personal. 
And that's a radical thing to those two concepts about God, that he's so big and yet so personal, so intimately personal. If you, can, if you really live by that, it'll radically alter your existence. You'll never be the same. You can't sin with impunity. You can't pull one over on the big guy upstairs, if you wish, right? It, it changes the way you think and act. And, and God is so big that, uh, that at precise moments in the great plan, uh, he's always had his agents there. For example, Noah. One of the, Noah stands as a good example of this for me. How that uh, Noah was a righteous man and God knew he was going to have three sons. He needed three sons to build that boat. <coughs> and uh, I believe that the year they finished building the boat, Noah's grandfather died, Methuselah, the oldest man. But he was a godly man, too. And the year that man died, things fell into place. The boat was there. The righteous people had all died off with the exception of this one family. And the time for judgment was there. And Jesus used the same analogy regarding the second coming. He said, just like it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, a whole series of events are going to converge at an instant in time and whap -oh, Christ is coming. Nothing will stop it. Next major development. It's, it's really exciting to contemplate how God works things out. And Noah was just an agent ready and willing to do the Father's will. I think of Moses, born in captivity, and of all the young boys that were murdered by the Pharaoh of the day, his life was spared. And he was pecked out of the water at a precise instant when his Pharaoh's daughter came to the river to bathe. You know, just a, what we would call a chance happening. Oh, there's a baby in this little bucket. You know, God worked those things out. And he became the great savior of Israel with the best training, with the experience you know, do you think that was accidental? I don't believe so. This was an evidence of the sovereignty of God working in people's lives. I, I read a story this week in my Reader's, in my Reader's Digest, in my Bible reading. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> and uh, the guy's name isn't even mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 9. Um, the, uh, the prophet told this young man to, uh, the Lord told this young man who's not even named to go to Jehu's house and Jehu was going to be the king of Israel, the ten tribes to the north. <laughs> go to his house, walk in unannounced, find Jehu, give him a message and then get out of there as fast as you can. And the message was, you're going to be the king and you're going to destroy all the existing descendants of the preceding king. And, uh, and so the timing was very important to the Lord. And this guy went in. They were having a party. All the generals, all the army officers were there in the house. He asked where Jehu is. They went into an inner chamber. The guy gave his message. He opened the door and ran right out, right through the hall, and took off. And these guys it unduly impressed them. What kind of a crazy guy is that? And because the guy did it, obeyed God with split-second timing, the message came across with the force that God intended it to come forth. And so God always has his agents in precise moments. Jehoiada, a person you probably never heard of, but he's there in Second Kings, a godly priest. And he was there, and God had him there looking after a seven-year-old boy, the sole survivor of the preceding dynasty. And this, this, this godly priest raised this boy to maturity and uh, put him in place, and he became one of the great, one of the last great kings of of Judah before they went into captivity. Jonah, the story of Jonah. You know, Jonah did not want to do what God wanted him to do. He didn't want to be God's agent. He lived in a time when the Assyrians to the north were threatening Israel. They had been threatening for a, for, for a number of years. And uh, God said, go up there. And he went the opposite direction. Tried anyway. The Lord gave him another route back, spit him out on the ground and said, go. And... No, Jonah went. And uh, after he succeeded in doing God's will, 
he, it depressed him because he saw this great revival of his worst enemies. They were all getting, becoming believers in, in, the Je in Jehovah God. And, and so he sat under a, a gourd and God sent a worm, a little worm, to eat the gourd. And, and that was precise, split-second timing, you know, to eat this gourd so that God would speak to Jonah. Right? So God uses people, he uses weather, he uses uh, empires even. It's not an accident that the Roman Empire was the empire in which Jesus was, in whose time Jesus was born. We're talking about agents being prepared by God. He uses empires, he uses history, he uses people, he uses nature, he uses animals, he uses anything to carry out his will. Now the example that we're looking at this morning is Saul of Tarsus. How did God prepare this man? I want to look at two things this morning. I want to observe, trace with me this morning, trace with you this morning, how God prepared Saul of Tarsus for the job that God had for him to do. And then I'd like to look at how he did it, at the job that he did. And, I, and just take that home with us to reflect on it. The story starts in Philippians chapter 3. <coughs> Hold your finger in Acts 21. We'll be coming back to it. But in Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes one of the accounts of his conversion. And, and in doing so, he gives us a little background information. Who was Saul of Tarsus? In verse 4 he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath reasons for which he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. But all those things which were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul was writing this from jail about 60 to 61 A.D. at the end of a full ministry. I believe he probably got out of jail for a year or two after writing this, and and that's when he wrote Second Timothy. But here Paul is in jail at the end of a ministry. He says, I've suffered to the loss of all things. I started out with everything in my bag. I had everything going for me. I was circumcised. I was a Jew. I was in the tribe of Benjamin. Right down there, close to all the action. That's where Jerusalem was, and Benjamin was the tribe that was, uh, that was situated right around Jerusalem. And uh, he was a Pharisee. I mean, he wasn't just anybody. He wasn't just sort of apathetic religiously. He was a, a real fanatic. And from a human perspective, Paul testifies. He says, anybody that knew me couldn't point their finger at me and say I was a bad Pharisee. I was blameless according to the human standard of excellence. So as, as touching the righteousness which are the law blameless, as I attain to their little nitty requirements. I was, I was climbing the ladder. And you read more about this in Galatians. Hold, hold your finger in Acts 21 and go back to Galatians chapter 1. Verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, he was having trouble with the with the Christians in the Roman province of Galatia and he was having to write to defend himself. So he was explaining his background to them. He says, I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my manner of life in time past, in the Jews' religion, how that Beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited 
in the Jews' religion, above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, immediately I did not confer with flesh and blood, neither did I run up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, but I went into the desert. I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went to Jerusalem. All right. So now come back to Acts chapter 21. Who was this all of Tarsus? According to the background, we know he was a Jew. He was circumcised. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee. These are facts that he repeatedly reiterates for his listeners in the, in the story that we're going to read. In after Paul left the elders at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, which is where we were last time we studied, it says in chapter 21 that he got in a boat and uh, he sailed back to the eastern end of the Mediterranean, landed in Caesarea um, or to, at Tyre and then uh, hopped up to another town to Caesarea and, and then... Uh, hooked up with a couple of other people and, and they, as a group, they came to the city of Jerusalem. So they went south to the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the capital of Judea. It was the religious center of Israel. And uh, he came to Jerusalem, verse 17 says, let's pick up and read a little bit here. Acts chapter 21, verse 17. Luke writes that when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And when he had greeted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they had heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are who believe, and they are all zealous of the law, and they are informed of thee that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that you are come. Do therefore this that we say to you. We have four men who have a vow on them. Take them and purify thyself with them and pay their expenses that they may shave their heads. And all may know that those things of which they were informed about you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. As touching the Gentiles who believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing except only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. That was the conclusion of the Acts 15 conference. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification, until an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews who were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people, laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere, one, against the people, two, against the law, three, against this place, fourth, has further brought Greeks into the temple, and fifthly, has polluted this holy place. Five false charges. For they had seen before with him in the temple Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they had supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Now this was no little thing. The next verse says that the whole city was moved. The people ran together, they took Paul, drew him out of the temple, and at once the doors were slammed shut, and they went about, they were going to rip him from limb, limb from limb. They were going to kill him on the spot. And the Romans intervened and saved his life. Now there is basically Paul's fourth visit to Jerusalem. I, I want you to, I, what I, I, I started off at the beginning and ended off at the end. Now let's back up, okay? I want to trace a little bit of background. I want you to see how that for this particular episode, there was a whole chain of preparatory events. God had prepared his man for this hour. It was not accidental. God knew that on the fourth trip, Saul of Tarsus was going to be captured. 
And as a result of that, he was going to be able to give a public defense to the Jewish people, which is what happened. It says, this is day one, by the way, in chapter 21. He, the day that he was, uh, that the big uproar took place was at the end of about seven days when Paul was there, probably at the Feast of uh, Pentecost, and he was preparing himself to offer offerings. And and he was captured, and he was um, uh, saved by the Romans. And uh, so as he was uh, going up the steps into the barracks where they were going to hold him overnight, uh, Paul talked in, in Greek to the Roman, uh, uh, to the soldier in charge of things, and the guy was surprised. He thought that, that, Paul, that Saul was an Egyptian troublemaker. Uh, this referred to elsewhere in the book of Acts. And, and so when he realized that Paul wasn't this Egyptian, then when Paul asked, can I just speak to these people for a few moments, uh, the guy said, sure. You know, he identified himself, and the guy gave him permission. So in verse 40, after receiving permission from the Roman guard to do this, he turns around from the steps, and he down he switches to Hebrew, and he speaks to all these people. As soon as he spoke in Hebrew, there was a great silence. There was a great uproar instantly turns into a great silence. Picture it. Thousands of people standing around. A few moments before seeking to rip this guy apart. And in chapter 22, in verses 1 to 21, Paul gives his first ever public defense of his conversion of his faith to the Jewish people. And, and he basically preaches the gospel to them. And... Um, this is something that God had wanted. He had desired it. And Paul was the person to do it. Now what brought, what prepared Paul for this particular situation? Well, let's back up for a moment. Uh, in, in this story, uh, in, in, in his speech in chapter 22, Paul reviews some of the things we've touched on. Verse 3, I'm a Jew. I was born in Tarsus, uh, up in Cilicia. I was raised and taught in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, famous Jewish rabbi, and raised and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers. He's alluding to his Pharisaic training. And uh, he says, you people know who I am. I was here 20 years ago. Over 20 years ago, I was that upstart Saul of Tarsus who was climbing the, the religious ladder up into the power structure here in Jerusalem, and I had uh, special permission to travel around bumping off Christians. And when they came to court, I'd give my word, and they were put to death for heresy. Right? And you people know this, he says, as also the high priest doth bear me witness in all the council of the elders that I did these things. And so Paul reviews um, where he came from. I, I, I don't think it was accidental that Paul's parents were Jewish and that his uh, father happened somehow to have gained Roman citizenship was a great prize in those days. Because of his Roman citizenship, he was saved from certain destruction at this particular instance. In chapter Now the next step in the story is chapter 9. Please back up to chapter 9. That's Paul's background in his early life and training. We are first introduced to Saul of Tarsus in the ninth chapter of Acts. Chapter 9, verse 1, describes young Saul breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He got permission to go to Damascus. He was on his way, verse 3. And that's when the Lord stopped him cold or perhaps hot on the, on the road to Damascus. And that was where he was converted. And uh, while he was coming into town, the Lord appeared to a man by the name of Ananias. In verse 10, read with me. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. To him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go to the street which is called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarshish, for before he is, behold, he is praying. In verse 1, Saul leaves Jerusalem breathing out threatenings. 
and God reduces him to his knees praying in a room blind. He can't see. He's helpless. All right? God got Saul's attention. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Now, Ananias had heard of this fellow. And so, he, naturally, he responds, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests up in Damascus to bind all that call on thy name. But, now this is the key verse to, to this first major point that I want to make in the message. This is the key verse. This shows that God had picked his man ahead of time and that was just pulling the strings to work it out so that Saul was well prepared for the job that he had to do. Notice, verse 15, the Lord said to Ananias, the Lord said unto him, Go your way, for he, that is Saul, is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Remember Philippians chapter 3, which we read a few moments ago? At the end of his life, God had brought Saul step by step through these things. Verse 9, or chapter 9, verse 15, is a key verse. He is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name, A, before the Gentiles, B, before kings, C, before the children of Israel. And I believe that it was done in reverse order. I believe that First and foremost, in Paul's ministry, he was brought by God. He was prepared over the years to bear the name of Christ before the Jewish people. That was his priority. Secondly, as you see quickly in chapter 24, 25, and 26 in the book of Acts, after he was arrested, then he preached to the kings. Festus, Felix, or Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. And then thirdly, when he got to Rome, then he, had, uh, he went right to the top. God took him right to the Supreme Court, right to the, to the Presidium in Rome, where he, uh, where he preached the gospel to, to Caesar and gave his testimony. And you, write, and you read in the last chapter of the book of Philippians, when at the end of his ministry, Paul was able to ask the Christians at Philippi to pray for people in Caesar's own house who had gotten saved as a result of his ministry, of his imprisonment, of his being captured and taken to Rome. Isn't it interesting how God prepares his man for the job? It really is. Saul is a marvelous example of this. And what we want to focus on this morning is how God particularly prepared Saul to be a witness to the children of Israel. That's just what I'm going to focus on this morning because this was Paul's fourth visit to Jerusalem. Let's review quickly. This was Saul's conversion and his commission. In chapter 22, uh, Paul reviews this for these people. He's speaking from this stairs going up into the Roman barracks out to this massive crowd of Jewish hotheads. And he reviews for them his own personal conversion. The Jews were an experience-oriented people. People had visions, no problem. They didn't have a problem with that. Angels speaking to people, no problem. We can take that. Miracles, no problem. The Jews were conditioned by their own history to, to be used to this sort of thing. And so when Paul stands up and tells his own personal experience, God had given him that experience because he knew that the people that he was going to be speaking it to would be particularly impressed. I think Jerry would be a little skeptical if I told you that my car broke down and an angel appeared to me out of heaven. You'd think I was another Joseph Smith. Right? But not so in this situation. So, let's read 22.6 and following. It came to pass that as I made my journey and was come near to Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said unto him, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spoke to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said, Arise, go to Damascus. It shall be told you there all things which are appointed for which are appointed for thee to do. Notice that? 
which are appointed for thee to do. I have a plan for you, buddy. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, I was led by the hand into the city, and Ananias came. He had a good report of all the Jews who lived there, verse 12. He came to me, spoke to me. The same hour I was healed, verse 13. And he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will and should see the just one and should hear the voice of his mouth, for you shall be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. And this was Paul's testimony of his conversion right there on the road to Damascus. This was the major step in Paul's preparation. He refers to it in Galatians 1, which we've read in chapter 26, before one of these kings subsequently. He said the same thing. He went through the same story. Now, verse 9 happens to be a problem verse. It seems to be contradictory to something you read in chapter 9. If you want to know the solution for that, talk to Luke. He has the solution. I do too, but I don't want to take time this morning. Right? Um, in one place it says that they didn't see, or they didn't hear the ver hear any hear anything, and in this place it says they heard the voice. There is a solution to that. It's not a contradiction. Another problem verse here is in verse 16. People that believe you have to be baptized in water to be saved always jump to this verse because it appears to read that because Paul was baptized, his sins were washed away. That's not what it says. That's only what it appears to say. He was told to get up and to be baptized. And how would his sins be washed away? By calling upon the name of the Lord. That's what it says. Right? It's not by being baptized that his sins were washed away. His sins were washed away by calling upon the name of the Lord. All right? So, anyway, just a passing comment. The point is, is that God prepared his men, converted him on the road to Damascus. And then, shortly thereafter, he took him to Jerusalem. His first visit to Jerusalem was kind of a private thing. He didn't... Um, He didn't see too many apostles, I think one or two apostles, but it, um, it was a, a memorable experience. His first visit in, in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 to 31, he went up there, and he tells about it right here. Let's read verses 17 to 21. This is what got Paul in trouble with these Jewish people here. It came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, that is, his first time back after being sent away to kill Christians, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. This is the only place we read about this fact. And saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get quickly out of this town, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. I said, But Lord. And, and he protests. And the Lord said, verse 21, Depart, for I will send thee far away from here unto the Gentiles. Paul was told that his primary ministry was going to be to the Gentiles. You read in Galatians chapter 1, Paul refers to Peter as the apostle to the circumcision, and Paul calls himself an apostle to the uncircumcision. In Romans chapter 11, he, he says the same thing, that I'm called not to go to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And yet, at his conversion on the Damascus Road, three things... Three stages of ministry God told Paul at the outset that he was going to go through. He was going to witness to the Jewish people. He was going to witness to kings and people in authority. And he was going to be a witness to Gentiles. And I believe that it was these visits to Jerusalem. I believe that it was Paul's background, the nature of his conversion, the experiences that he had when he was doing mission work that prepared Paul for... Um, his ministry to the Jewish people. I don't think any of it was accidental. The first time he went up there to Jerusalem, Galatians chapter 1 tells us that he met Peter and, and uh, James. He had a private conference with them. Acts 9 tells us that when he went in there, he was disputing with Gentiles who had become proselytes to the Jewish religion. They got so mad at him, they tried to kill him, and the, Jew and the Christians sent him home to Tarshish. Before that had happened, three years had ensued, and, and he had spent a long time in the Arabian wilderness. I believe that Paul restudied the Old Testament shortly after he got saved. Galatians chapter 1 tells us that. 
He was gone for three years. I think that he went into the wilderness. He, he didn't get this from any of the other apostles. It was a divine revelation to Paul and got him to see all things about the Christ in the Old Testament. Retrain this Pharisee. And it's no accident that in Paul's writings, which make up almost the bulk of the New Testament, that you have more quotations from the Old Testament than any of the other New Testament writers. This man knew his Old Testament like the back of his hand. And, and he had, his mind had been recircuited by the, by the Creator to understand its, its true message. It wasn't just a message of works, it was a message about the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Holy One that come to give people life. And henceforth, in his preaching and teaching, uh, Paul always preached this extra addendum to the message of the Old Testament that all the Jewish people like. I mean, they didn't care if you reviewed Jewish history to show that God chose the Jewish people. They say, amen, preach it, brother. You know, we know we're special. We're the apple of God's eye, right? But when Paul went one step further and said, well, David says in Psalm 2 and Psalm 16, and Isaiah says in 52 and 53, and Jeremiah in, in chapter 23, and, and on and on and on, that your Messiah would come, he would suffer and die for sins, and he would be rejected by his own people, and you people are blind and stupid because you don't believe in him. You stumbled at the rock that came. Then they got angry at him. They tried to kill him. And he opened and alleged everywhere he went to Jewish people from their scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. I've got a little ahead of myself. Paul's second visit to, to Jerusalem is recorded in Acts chapter 11. He went down carrying money from Antioch to Jerusalem. He stayed there. That's when James was killed by Herod. Um, Barnabas and he were there during this time when Peter was let out of jail. This is about 10 years after he was saved. Then he goes back, he does mission work. The third time he comes to um, Jerusalem is recorded in Acts chapter 15 when some people came to his home church from Jerusalem, some Jewish people, some men, and they were preaching that you had to be baptized, excuse me, that you had to be circumcised and to keep the laws of Moses before you could be considered a Christian. And in Acts chapter 15, we've already talked about this in one of our other studies, how that Paul, ha Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension they stood up in church and said, that is wrong. That's wrong. And uh, there was a big, big hullabaloo in Antioch. Finally, they decided, let's go back to Jerusalem where these guys came from to see where this is coming from. And so the third visit that Paul had to Jerusalem was he was there and, and let his voice be heard when the church, the Jewish church decided that non-Jews didn't have to keep the Mosaic law to become saved. Right? That was a tremendous decision that was made. Well, 12 more years pass. Uh, more, no, it's... Uh, the la Paul's last visit was in, was in 57, 57 A.D. And uh, this is recorded here that we read this morning. Paul comes, and this is where he was captured. You see, Paul had a premonition, more than a premonition. He had specific prophecies that this was going to happen. This was God's will for his life. I read a book not too long ago by Hal Lindsey on uh, the New Testament. And Hal Lindsey believes that uh, Paul sinned when he went to Jerusalem, that the Holy Spirit was saying, don't go. Uh, if you want to just hold your finger here and go with me to chapter 20 for a moment. In verse 22 and 23, Paul testified when he was up in Asia to the, to the elders. He said, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except that the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. Paul was being prepared by the Holy Spirit for his ministry in Jerusalem, his fourth trip. That was his last trip, his last visit to Jerusalem. He almost died two or three times. They tried to kill him several times. He ended up in Rome 
where he eventually did die as a result of this. In chapter 21, when he came uh, and landed on, on the shores of the Mediterranean, it, uh, it said in verse 4 that some of the Christians at a place called Tyre warned Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And then verse 11, when he came to Caesarea, an old buddy of his by the name of Agabus showed up. He was a prophet, verse 10. And he came up, grabbed Paul's belt, tied up his own hands and, f and feet with it, and said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this belt and shall deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. And everybody then got on Paul's case and said, Don't go, don't go. And he said, No, I'm going. I, he would not be persuaded, Luke says in verse 14, The will of the Lord be done. Now, I don't know. It's purely conjecture as to whether or not Paul, God could have worked it out some other way. I'm sh I know Paul, God could have, but this is what ended up doing. And, you know, I don't believe it was wrong for Paul to go. He was persuaded back in chapter about 19. He purposed in his heart to go to Jerusalem, it says. He wanted to be there. He hadn't been there yet. He had been preaching to Gentiles, and he hadn't been preaching to any kings yet. And he knew that. So he wanted to go to Jerusalem because he knew that was where the power structure lie, and that's where the Romans had their head outposts and stuff. And he, he figured, i got to get into this sooner or later. I want to do what the Lord has for me to do. And so nothing was going to turn him. And this was the Lord's preparation. Frequently in his ministry, Paul preached to Jews. Everywhere he went, he first went to the synagogue, preached the gospel to the Jews. If you like a couple of examples, please turn with me. I know we're running out of time. I've got one minute. How about an example? Acts chapter 28. Verse 17. The last time we have a record of Paul preaching to Jewish peoples right here. It came to pass when he got to Rome after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. When they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. He says, I had a couple of court appearances. I had to appeal to Caesar to get justice. Verse 20, For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you. Notice, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We haven't heard anything about you. Verse 22, We desire to hear of you what you think. For as concerning this sect, referring to the Christians, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they appointed him a day, there came many to him to his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, and out of the prophets from morning till evening. A whole day he spent with his leaders in Rome. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some didn't. And uh, they left. They were divided. And Luke says that... Uh, well, Paul said when they left, he says, this is exactly what Isaiah said, what happened to you people. Hearing you shall hear and not understand. Seeing you shall see and not perceive. The heart of this people has become obtuse. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest they should see. Be it known, therefore, to you that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Verse 31. Well, Paul spent two more years preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. He had a hired house paid by the Romans, and he was there to do mission work. And I want you to see that God prepared his man. You may wonder why the things have happened to you that have happened to you. Why did you not get an education? Why did you marry the person you married? Why did that person marry you? <laughs>